Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, Jonathan is Saul's son, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field until the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the clan. If he says, Good, it will be well with your servant. But if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant. And again, your servant is a, a humble way to refer to yourself in the third person when talking to somebody. So when he says, deal kindly with your servant, he means deal kindly with me. For you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, far be it from you. If I knew that it was determined by my father that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. So we left David at Naoth in the city of Ramah with Samuel. Samuel was the prophet who had anointed Saul as king at the people's request. But Saul, through his, his reign, had deviated from following the Lord and had come to a breaking point between him and Samuel, where Samuel said, I'm not going to be speaking to you anymore. If this is how you're going to be, then this is how it's going to be. Well, God called Samuel also to anoint David as king. David very famously burst onto the scene when he slew Goliath at the battle with the Philistines, and he became one of Saul's uh, close confidants, one of his military commanders. But this led to jealousy from Saul, who knew that the kingdom was going to be given to another, and also resented the popularity and the love that the people had for David, even those within his own family. So even though David was best friends with his son Jonathan, and even though he even married Saul's daughter Michael, Saul had tried to kill him several times, whether by luring him into dangerous situations or by hurling a spear at him himself. And that's why David had fled to Naoth to be with Samuel. And when Saul came to arrest him, the Holy Spirit had humbled him. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul, caused him to prophesy in this ecstatic state, which I tend to think those prophecies were, David is going to be the king and no longer me, but also had him strip off his clothes and lay down prostrate in the presence of the prophet Samuel. And I think that's symbolic also, stripping off the royal robes that God had given him. It was a humiliating scene where God was asserting his authority over Saul. Well, that's the last thing we saw. And David is left there and tries to get in touch with Jonathan. Jonathan, who is his brother-in-law, his best friend, and we discussed before, probably much more like a mentor-type figure than just a buddy, because Jonathan was older than David, and it seems that he sees this young man coming into the king's court, coming into this world of politics and warfare, and he says, Med, you come with me. We both love the Lord, we both serve Him together, and I'll show you the ropes. I think that can help color our relationship or our understanding of the relationship of David and Jonathan here. And David says, Jonathan, your dad's trying to kill me. Can you please explain what's going on? And it's interesting because Jonathan says, David, dad is not trying to kill you. Which is funny to us because we just read that. We just read exactly that. But I think what Jonathan is doing here is, number one, his dad probably hadn't said anything to him about it. Because Saul was, was trying to be sneaky. He was trying to be crafty. He was trying to, again, put David in situations where he would most likely die. And the times that he had thrown a spear at David had been during these fits that he would get into when and a wicked spirit from the Lord would harass him in order to, to torment him for rejecting the Lord and rejecting the spirit of the Lord. So Jonathan's probably thinking, David... I know dad is not himself sometimes. And sometimes dad has these fits. That's how you first met. Remember, you came in to play the harp for dad and calm him down. And so I know he's thrown the spear, but dad loves you. He wouldn't do that to you. But David has to convince him. Because Jonathan, you're wrong about this. There's just a step, he said, between me and death. So Jonathan doesn't believe him, but he, he's, not, he's not dismissing him either. 
He says, okay, well, what do you want to do, David? What shall we do in order to determine this? And David says, well, the new moon is coming up, and there's a feast that happens during that time, and since I'm the king's son-in-law, and because I'm the king's commander of his armies, I should be there. It's expected that I would be there. So uh, I won't show up this time, and I want you to gauge your father's reaction. If your dad is okay with it, all right, fine, David's not here, then well and good, things are probably all right. But if your dad loses his temper, then I want you to see that, Jonathan, as a sign that your dad does indeed have it out for me. The Bible doesn't tell us new much, very much about the New Moon Festival. It, it more mentions it in passing several times. This, of course, was every month. The Hebrews followed a lunar calendar. We follow a solar calendar. Every day is based upon uh, when the sun rises and sets, and then we measure our years by the sun's revolution around the earth. Well, what the Hebrews did is they measured it by the moon, and then you knew the month was over when the moon was full, and then it, it waned until it was gone, and then the first sliver of the crescent came out. And they would have a feast every month when this happened. Number 29.6 mentions that there should be a burnt offering given on the new moon, but it, it just kind of in passing listed in a number of things where they would do burnt offerings. Psalm 81 verse 3 mentions it as a day of offering and feasting and festival. And Ezekiel 46.6 talks about in the kingdom, when the new temple is, is built in the kingdom, that the, the priesthood there will celebrate the new moon. And he talks about the seven different sacrifices, burnt offerings and grain offerings. So Although it's not like part of the law, like you shall keep it this way, it just seemed to be part of their culture, that every month they had a feast, they had a festival, and it seems to have lasted at least two days. I read a couple different opinions on that, but they, some people think it was you started it on the day when you couldn't see the moon, and then you had it on the second day when that first sliver of, of crescent moon came through. Uh, that's what the festival is we're talking about. Most of the references to it come from the prophets telling the people, God is sick and tired of the way you have your new moon festivals. Not because they were worshiping the moon or any such thing, but he said, you think I am pleased with these festivals and you're full of sin. So that's actually most of where the Bible talks about it. But David says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not show up. You tell your dad that I went to Bethlehem and we'll see what dad says about it. And David actually tells him, Jonathan, if, if your dad thinks that I deserve to die, then would you just strike me down now? Because I can't take the intrigue. I'm a shepherd boy, I'm not a, I'm not a courtier, right? I'm not a counselor, an advisor, I'm not one of those guys. I'm a soldier, I'm a shepherd. If, you, if dad thinks I need to die, then just kill me. But don't stretch it out, don't lie to me, Jonathan. So David's upset, as you can imagine here, right? He was a loyal subject, and this was his family. He had married into it, but it was his family. And Jonathan strongly denies, I, David, I would never kill you. Even if dad thought you deserved to die, I would warn you so that you could get away. Don't think that I'm hiding something from you. It's a shame how sometimes wicked people or wicked circumstances can breed mistrust even between great friends. And I think Jonathan recognizes that, which is what we're going to see in the next section here. This is the example in the Bible of friendship. David and Jonathan is the example of what friendship should look like in the Bible. We read in chapter 18, verse 1, that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Jonathan was truly living out the commandment from Leviticus to love your neighbor as yourself, right? And this is why we, we see in, in all sorts of literature and things that there's very close companions. They'll name them David and Jonathan because we know about this. And that's what we're going to talk about today is friendship. Friendship in the church and, and friendship in life in general. Now, this might seem a little silly to define this, but I just thought it was interesting to look into it. What is a friend? It is a close relationship outside of your family. So a relationship that you are not obligated to have, right? Sometimes you, you work for a, a company and they kind of say, well, we're all family here. It's like, no, we're not. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't fire your, your kids if they, you know, they don't live up to your your quarterly projections or something like that. But this is a, a real friend built upon personal regard for another, right? Personal regard. I am a friend to you because I like you. I love you and have a relationship with you because I have chosen to have this relationship. And the Bible has a lot to say about friendship. Most of it is descriptive, and uh, most of it comes from the book of Proverbs. So I'm going to read three verses here on how the Bible describes this kind of relationship, a non Official, non-forced, non-compulsory relationship that you have with another. 
Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. So at all times, a friend loves at all times, and the parallelism indicates to us not just in the good times, but in times of adversity too. Proverbs 27, 9 says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad. And all the ladies said, Amen. And the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Earnest counsel. It's like when you, when you take a bath and you've got the perfume and you've got the, the scented conditioner and it's all, you come out feeling clean and wonderful. Everybody goes, wow, you smell nice. He says, your friendships are like that with the earnest counsel that you give to one another. There, there's a relationship of what should I do? Here's what I think you should do. Hey, I've been watching this. What do you think about that? There's those, those long talks that you'll have maybe. Proverbs 27, 6, just a few verses before that one, said, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. That tells us that a friend is the kind of person who will call you out, mister. <laughs> the wounds of a friend. You said that. That hurt me. Yep, you needed it. Meanwhile, enemies will just still give profuse kisses. Everything they say is wonderful and, and sweet, and you're so wonderful, and mwah, 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 you're just so great. When what you might need is a backhand across the face and get your act together. That's a true friend, isn't it? So that's what the Bible says. A friend is somebody who loves another, even through adversity, with sincerity in counsel, even if that advice wounds the other person. You know, there, there are some very strange definitions that will float out occasionally about friendship, and people will say things like, if you really love me, you would support me in everything. No way. <laughs> No way. It'd be very easy to come up with some things that I won't support you in. I'm going to buy a hang glider and jump off a building and see if I can't fly through the window like that video game I played that one time. No, you shouldn't do that. That's a stupid idea. Why can't you ever just support me in the things that I do? I do that to my wife sometimes. I'll make ridiculous suggestions and she'll say, of course not. I say, why can't you ever just support me in the things I want to do? What people say is, a friend will validate everything that I say. Nonsense, right? What that ends up being is I don't really want a friend. I want a yes man. I want somebody to tell me yes all the time. I'm going, you know, he's changed. We're getting back together. He's so sweet to me now. You're out of your mind. Block his number. Why can't you ever just support me in things? Because faithful are the wounds of a friend. Hey, it's not cool for you to talk to her like that. You got to cut that out. Hey, man, that really hurts my feelings when you say that to me. Well, good. Your feelings deserve to be hurt after what you just did. That's a true friend. Somebody who's not a true friend is somebody who says, hey, do whatever you want, and I'll be there for you. There's a difference between being there for somebody and, you know, telling somebody they're a knucklehead and you've got to get your act together, and then being there for somebody, isn't there? That's why I think a lot of times you'll see people that are like that. They don't really have a lot of friends. You get people together that all kind of have this weird, <laughs> this weird agreement, maybe it's unspoken, that says, we're all doing a bunch of bad stuff, and we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. So we'll hang out together, and nobody will say anything to anybody. And that, that's not a good friendship. That's not a good relationship, is it? But, I, you know, I say that, but I, I actually was thinking about this, and I want to make sure I, I give our culture its due. Our culture does a pretty good job of valuing friendship. You know, sometimes we'll talk about, when's the last time you saw a father positively portrayed on TV? Or when's the last time you saw this and that? It's pretty easy to find good examples of friendship. And this is where I think we can give ourselves a pat on the back, that we understand this, that you need people that are maybe not family that are going to stand with you and walk with you through life. So uh, we, are, we grew up as, our, as a nation. We grew up as transient people coming across the ocean, coming across the nation, leaving to where the jobs are. And I think just culturally, we developed an instinct that you need to develop relationships and connections deeply and quickly with the people that you come across. And that's to our credit. Because that's an area where we are actually in line with what the Lord tells us to do. You need people like this in your life. You need people that are going to be with you through adversity. that are going to love you no matter what. Even and up to shaking you by the shoulders and saying, get a hold of yourself. You need both of them. You can see that Jonathan is trying to do that for David right now, isn't he? David, you're crazy. That's not the way it is. They're, they're arguing, but respectfully. And Jonathan even disagrees, but he says, all right, David, I think you're wrong, but I see this means an awful lot to you. What can I do to help you in this time? That's a friend. That's a real friend. If you were my real friend, you wouldn't even argue with me. That's not the case. And you know, that's what the church is for. 
The church is obviously, it's the, it's the fellowship of people that believe in Christ and have come together. But one major reason that Jesus gave us the church, broadly, is to provide friendships for Christians. So that you can be in a place where you look around the room and there's a bunch of people in here that you can become friends with. Friendship built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. That's the difference between fellowship and just interaction. My dad used to ask me that all the time when I'd hang out with my friends in high school. He says, do you guys uh, have a good time? Yeah. I said, did you have any fellowship or were you just hanging out? And I would say, dad. What he meant by that is, was there anything about this interaction that was centered around Jesus or the word or what God has done in your life? And, and I'm happy to say that most of the time, yeah, that was the case. But that's what the church is for. It's very hard sometimes to find people that are trying to serve Jesus in your neighborhood or your workplace, or even those that say they are, and then when it really comes down to it, it's nominal, or or you want to go deeper, and you want to understand more, and you're just desperate to know more about Christ. Well, this is what the church is for, to be filled with other people like that. Jesus himself in John 15 called us his friends. Isn't that amazing to think about? Jesus said, I've I've called you friends. He says, I'm not going to call you servants anymore. He says, you know why? Because servants don't know what their masters are doing. Servants do as they're told. He says, but I'm, I'm telling you everything. I'm telling you all the plan from start to finish because we're friends. We are connected in this way. And every single one of us have a mutual friend named Jesus. That's how you make most friends is to get most of your jobs and, and do most of the fun things. You have a mutual friend that knows somebody. So we all know the same Lord Jesus, and that's what we're here for is to be that kind of support for one another. And David's Jonathan, David and Jonathan's relationship was built upon faith. That, that was their, their, their thing they had in common. Was they both had great faith and tried for miraculous victories and won them. And so should ours be, built upon the faith of Jesus Christ. Verse 12, remember there, there's this kind of tension where David's like, I trust you, Jonathan, but who can I really trust these days? And Jonathan said, Dad's not trying to kill you. I, I really don't think he is. And he said, look, well, if you're really... If you really are not going to do this, if you really uh, don't believe your dad is scheming against me, then how can I be sure? And so Jonathan takes him out into the field. In verse 12, Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow on the third day, or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So in order to resolve this, Jonathan goes, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make a covenant together. A covenant is a formal agreement that involves God in the conversation. You're going to do this. I'm going to do this before the Lord. And this is out in a field where nobody can see them. And Jonathan invokes God to bear witness. He says, the Lord judge between you and me. I'm going to do everything I can to protect you, David. I think you'll be fine, but if not, I'm going to send you away. I will not deliver you over to my father so that you can be killed. And they make this covenant. And Jonathan acknowledges that God has made David king. This is the heir to the throne, speaking to the one that the king is worried might be a usurper and telling him, I know God has given you the throne. Therefore, may the Lord drive away your enemies. Which is amazing because at this point, his own father was David's enemy. But what he asks him to do, he says, David, when you become king, swear to me that you will not take vengeance upon my children. Because this is what was done. That when you became king, if there were any other heirs to the throne who could be a point of rebellion at some point, they were killed. This is just what was done. And so Jonathan says, David, I know that God's going to make you king one day. When that day happens, promise me you will spare my family. And you know what? David is going to do exactly that. In chapter 9 of 2 Samuel, we will meet Mephibosheth. And we will see how David is going to honor this covenant that he makes with Jonathan. So the deal is, with the Lord as our witness, I'm going to protect you and will not work harm against you. You won't work harm against me when you take the throne and may God's will be done. 
So it's kind of formally, maybe there was a ceremony, I'm sure, that they went through to kind of swear to David, I promise you, I'm not going to do you harm. And again, it emphasizes the love that these two had for each other, even in the midst of this difficult situation, when, by all accounts, they should have been enemies by now. In fact, most circumstances, you would probably see Jonathan as the aggressor rather than Saul, wouldn't you? That the one who might be king someday has his eye on the one who might be stealing his thunder. At this time, I would like to address something that often comes up when we talk about David and Jonathan. And it's a shame we have to address it, but we're gonna. There is a very perverse accusation that Jonathan and David had a homosexual relationship with one another. You see this online, you see this in various books. I've seen those that are apologists for homosexuality come out and say, well, what about David and Jonathan? God approved of that. That was in the Bible. And the reason they say that is from, from all the verses we read so far about the love they had for each other. And then in 2 Samuel 1.26, when David is writing a lament for, for Saul and Jonathan when they, when they die, David will say, Jonathan's love was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. So I see right there the love of women. David preferred Jonathan. So that tells us that David and Jonathan had a homosexual relationship. I'm just going to not spoil my opinion here. This is preposterous. This is absolutely outrageous, has nothing to do with the text of Scripture, and it is a mark of a vile culture that is willing to defile even the most wholesome parts of Scripture for their own gain. Well, that's what I have to say about it. Let's defend that a little bit. First of all, why is this the case? Why are they not in a homosexual relationship? Well, first of all, David and Jonathan were both godly men. They are the examples in these books, alongside Samuel, of the ones that actually served the Lord and kept the law and did what God said. David is called a man after God's own heart. Jonathan recognized that about him and took him under his wing. And they both knew that God had prohibited those things. Leviticus 18.22, Leviticus 20, verse 13, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. Of course, the New Testament will emphasize this as well, that such people will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. So they knew that. And if the Bible can make with any kind of straight face the claim that these were godly men, that cannot be true about them. So that, let's just put that to the side. Secondly, people today like to use the terminology that describes them where it says the love that they had for each other greater than the love of women. I loved you as my own soul. When it says later that they will weep and they will kiss uh, one another. They say, see, all these things, this is all very romantic, it's all very sexual, and this is, this is what we're looking at here. Well, no, that's not the case. It's always a bad idea when you are reading a translated text to use the English turn of phrase and the English connotations for certain phrases to determine theology. Okay? Deuteronomy 13, verse 6, describes a friend as somebody who is as your own soul. And that is in a completely different context. Job 19.19, 19, Job describes my intimate friends whom I loved. Psalm 55 verse 20 mentions the covenants that friendship will, will, friends will make with one another. So apparently there was such a thing as a friendship covenant at this time. What am I trying to say? The language that the Bible uses to describe David and Jonathan is not unique to David and Jonathan. This is how the Bible, the Hebrew culture, described close friends. What is it? Oh, they, he loved him as his own soul. Well, yeah, that's how friends were described. And this is actually how the Lord told us to love one another, isn't it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, there it says they were intimate. It says they loved one another. Yeah, this is how friends, this word was described. We use the word love and we think romance. The word for them was much broader, as it also is in English, by the way. And Psalm 55, 20 talks about this covenant. So it's not like, oh, they had this secret special ceremony. No, this, is, this was done at the time, according to the Bible. So you can't take the way it describes their relationship and say, therefore, this is something out of the ordinary. No, it certainly was not, although it was certainly special. And, of course, there's this thing, the, the love of Jonathan was better than the love of women. It really bothers me to hear people say that that is evidence of some sort of sexual perversion because it's actually right in line with Jesus said later. By saying that David's love for his friend was better than the romantic love he had for his wives is actually just what Jesus said in John 15, 13. Jesus said, greater love has no one than this. And he lays down his life for his friends. So we value very highly, as we should, Romantic love, but 
The Bible tells us the greater love even than that is the kind of self-sacrificial love you have for somebody that you have no obligation to. Interesting, isn't that? Love is to be the Christian attitude toward all people. It does not necessarily imply romance. That's obvious. We, we kind of make fun of English sometimes, and it bugs me as a proud English speaker myself. So you, you say you love ice cream and you love your wife. Yes, that's called flexibility of language. We have that. But you know that even the English word for friend, I looked this up, the word friend comes from a proto-Germanic word. It is a participle of the verb meaning to love. So even our word friend, in, in the ancient way it was first used, meant one who loves, or even lover in that way. So even when we say friend, if you want to go all the way back, we're saying the person that we love. People who talk this way confuse love with sex. They are not the same thing. That should be obvious to us. But let me just say that again. Love and sex are not the same thing. The Bible does not recognize them as being the same thing, nor does common sense. I mean, this should be obvious, right? But the problem is, this agenda to push this homosexual view on everybody, they don't talk about sex. They don't even like you calling them homosexual, by the way. They say, no, it's about love. You see the little pins everywhere. Love is love. When a Burgerfell versus Hodges was decided, love wins. Nobody has ever been prohibited from loving anybody, ever. No, well, I wasn't allowed to love who I love. And they say, do you have a problem with homosexuality? No, I mean, you've got you to love who you love. That's not what this is. That's not what homosexuality is about. If you, as a man, love your father, are you a homosexual? No. Of course not. If you, as a man, love your friend or your son, are you a homosexual? Of course not. Ladies, same thing. If you love your mother dearly, are you a lesbian? No. What's the difference? Sex is the difference. That's why I do not like euphemisms when it comes to these things. This is why I stridently do not use the alphabet acronym of the LGBTQIA+. No, this is homosexuality. It is a biblical term. And the reason they use those terms is because they're trying to cover up the fact that what they are doing is actually something perverse and something that most people would agree should not be done. They want to cloak it in identity and love when we're not talking about love. Well, I just love this person with all my heart and I'm not allowed. No, you can love them, but you shouldn't have sex with them. Well, then I can't love them. Then that means you are so confused in your mind about what real love is. We need to address that long before we address this other thing. Don't you understand this in your own marriages? That there can be sex without love? Haven't you experienced this perhaps in your life before you came to Christ? That there was all kinds of sex, but there was no love anywhere. They're not the same thing. And when we confuse sex with love, or we confuse affection with attraction, what you do is you actually undermine the possibility of having a true friendship without those things. I'll tell you, because I'm a, I'm a young man, and especially young men growing up, are very leery of having dear, close relationships with their male friends because they're afraid they're going to be accused of being a homosexual or they might even think in their own mind, man, I'm getting really close to this guy. Am I gay? And it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a tragedy because you are depriving young men and young women and, and however you want to do it, you are depriving them of something they need and something that Jesus himself said is even better than the other kinds of love, that kind of self-sacrificial friendship. And some people do this out of an awkward desire to try to avoid being sinful. I don't really think I should spend any more time with her because, you know, that, that might be pushing it too much. The devil has used this as a wedge to rip apart so many amazing things. But I think we understand the love between brothers, the love between sisters, friends in that way. Soldiers understand this. You hear them talk about this. I never served myself, but you hear them talk about that love they had for the, the brothers in their unit like, I'd, I'd die for those guys to this day. There was a connection we had that will never be duplicated anywhere else. And some men that have come out of the service have even said the hardest thing is leaving behind those guys. You know, it amazes me. If you ever watch uh, an old war movie, and maybe they have interviews from some of the, the men that served, I think of the Band of Brothers series on, on World War II. And these men are, are they're very old now when they were recording it, and they'll still break down weeping at the drop of a hat as they think of one of their buddies that was shot. That's love. That is real friendship love. Athletes understand this too. 
You played football with somebody for a while. You played on a baseball team with somebody. You've worked hard and yelled at each other and fought with each other and strove toward that common goal, whether you succeeded or failed. You're always going to have a connection and a friendship. I remember, here's an example of this. There was a a fun interview that was done where Kobe Bryant was doing a, a, a press conference, and one of the guys that came there had actually been on a high school team with Kobe Bryant. And he showed up, and he didn't tell him who he was, and he immediately recognized him. He goes, hey! He's like, this dude is a world-famous basketball player. He's playing with Shaquille O'Neal, right? He's playing with Carl Malone. And here's somebody that he just played in high school with. And there's an immediate recognition, immediate love for this person. And Christian brothers understand this too. You know what it's like to serve with someone. You go on a mission trip with somebody, you're either going to hate each other's guts for the rest of your life, or that's a bond that's never going to be broken. Going to summer camp with your, with your youth group, for example. You know, even when I was in school, I've got friends that I went to high school with that I haven't seen in decades. If they were to call me today and say, I need you, I'd be on a plane. hope they feel the same way about me, too. I would think they do. Even people that you've drifted from, or even people you've had serious arguments with, that's serious personal intimacy on a spiritual level. And it is something we're commanded to have for one another as Christians. Romans 12.10 says, Love one another with brotherly affection. (laughs) I like that verse because sometimes people try to get cute and they say, Love one another. Now, this doesn't mean you have to like, you know, like each other. Just as long as you're doing the right thing. No, Paul says, with brotherly affection. Affection. Every mom in here has a picture of her, her little kids like hugging each other when they didn't think she was looking or holding hands or something. Oh, look at how much they, they're so sweet. Paul goes, I want you all to be like that for each other. That kind of brotherly affection. This is why I, I despise this perverse accusation against Jonathan and David. Because they ought to be an example to the rest of us of what true love between friends should look like. You need that in your life. And this is not to diminish romance or marriage or any such thing. I think we all know that. But I'm just telling you, we work very, very hard at cultivating and and developing our marital relationship. We should do the same thing with the friendships that we have also. All right, hopefully that's been laid to rest for you. But let's move on to verse 18. This might be the, the least flattering story of Saul that we have in our Bible. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand, and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. Behold, I will send the boy, saying, Go find the arrows. If I say to the boy, Look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them, then you are to come. For as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, Look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat, as at other times, on the seat by the wall. That might be an evidence of Saul's paranoia here. Nobody gets behind the king, right? Jonathan sat opposite, and Abner, the general, sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. But on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? (laughs) Calling him the son of Jesse may be a a slight towards David, because he was also the king's son-in-law. He's like, I don't even want to name that guy. Where's the, uh, the son of Jesse today? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. That could indicate real quickly that Jesse had passed away at this time, uh, because his brother is the one commanding him, but that is not necessarily the case. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. (laughs) There's an insult. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. 
So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. All right, so here's the first day of the feast. Saul let David slide for not being there the first day because he said he was probably not clean. And now this is clean according to the law of Moses, that if you had touched a dead body, if you had encountered certain kinds of animals, uh, there were various sicknesses that could make you unclean when you weren't supposed to be around people. So he thinks, ah, he's probably unclean. Gives us a little glimpse into Israelite life that sometimes that happened. But the second day, he's like, oh, no, that's not a, that's not a coincidence. So what's going on? And Jonathan makes up this excuse to test his father. And Saul explodes and insults Jonathan for shaming his mother. You son of a perverse, rebellious woman. I wonder if, if Mrs. Saul was sitting right there. Like, hey, you know, but she's not about to say anything to this guy. Not in this state, right? Now, he says, you've shamed your mother's nakedness. What is he talking about? Well, the, uh, your mother's nakedness, this is a reference to his birth, to his copulation that resulted in his birth. So when he's saying you're shaming your mother, you're shaming the woman that brought you into this life, saying, your mother gave birth to one who is destined to be the king of Israel. And instead, you have thrown your support in the one that is going to take away your own place. You're shaming yourself. You're shaming your family. Now go get him and bring him back here so we can put him to death. And Jonathan asks some very righteous questions. What has he done? What does he do that makes him deserving of death? And Saul picks up a spear and hurls it at his brother. His, brother, his, uh, his son, excuse me. And Jonathan stormed out. He's furious. And you can see how he's, he's angry because David has been maligned by Saul, but also Jonathan himself has been shamed. This is an honor-shame culture at this time. This is, you, you were, your respect and how you were treated by other people meant very much. And to be treated that way by your own father in his court was a big deal. This is what friends do. <laughs> This is called loyalty. When you stand by your friend in their time of need, even at personal risk. Remember, Jonathan didn't really believe David. He wasn't thinking he was crazy, but he thought, no, dad doesn't want to kill you, David. Just, you know, Saul's temper. He's, he's got this, this, these moods that come upon him. But he said, I'll go and I'll, I'll do what you say. I'll, I'll act on your behalf before my father. And this almost led to Jonathan being killed. It is necessary to be loyal to our friends. There are going to be days where your friends will go through trials. Those that you love will be going through difficult times. I have personally found it is harder for me when somebody I love is going through a difficulty than when I'm going through one myself. I'm good. I can handle this. But if I see my, my children get hurt, or if I see my wife in distress or if my sisters or my, my parents are dealing with some difficulty, or if one of you, to be quite honest, if one of you calls me and tells me what's going on in your life, that hurts my heart more than it does myself. And loyalty is somebody that doesn't just feel that, but who says, I will stand by you and do whatever it takes. Now, sometimes there's really nothing more to be done than just to put the arm around him and say, hey, I've got you, bro, I'm right here for you. But sometimes you've got to take a stand for your friend. And to fail in that trial, you can break up a man when you do that. If somebody is your friend up until the day they desperately need you and you let them down, you will break that person. Because when things start to collapse in your life, you lose your job, sickness, whatever it might be, your, your temptation is to think everything is falling apart and, and life is no good. But what they will hold on to is, but at least I've got my friends. At least I've got him. At least I've got her to stand with me. And if you let them down in that time, they'll collapse into themselves. And not only that, you will displease the Lord. Hey, God's going to be right there for you. Yeah, he will, but God also says, you be right there for them. You be them. I'm going to use them, use you to help them. Job 6.14 says, He who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Oh, I love the Lord. But you withhold kindness from your friend? You've forsaken the fear of the Almighty. John would say something very similar, right? He says, Beloved, let us love one another. He who does not love does not know God. I love that apostle, that, that old apostle at the end of his life, seeing all sorts of pretentious people popping up, talking about what Jesus really was and what he really taught. And he goes, if you don't love people, you don't know God, and you don't need to listen to those people. Don't let them bother you. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. 
So for you to withhold kindness from a friend, Job says you're forsaking the fear of the Almighty. Now there is a hierarchy of these things. And, and the interesting thing is Jonathan is kind of caught in the middle here between his father and his own interests and his friends. So how do you determine which ones? Well, the good news is that there's one who ranks above all no matter what, and that's our Lord. Jesus ranks above all. What has God said? What is righteous? What needs to be done? Yes, it, it would be good for my father to have a potential threat to the throne removed. It'd be good for me to make things peaceful in my house. And doesn't family come first? I mean, yeah, kind of it does. However, what does God say? That the innocent are not to be harmed. This is not how my, my kings are to rule, the Lord had said. With justice and with, without taking bribes or, or looking at things in a certain way. So Jonathan knows that you're in the wrong here, Dad, and I'm going to stand by my brother. I'm going to stand by my friend. That's why Jonathan refused to do wickedly, even when it would benefit him. That's, that really shows his character, isn't it? Jonathan refused to do something that everybody would have expected him to do, but would have been wicked, even though it might have profited him. There will be times when the downfall of one of your friends could profit you when it could be good for you to see one of your friends do poorly. Perhaps you work together, and you know they're kinda, they kind of rank ahead of you. And if they were to do badly, that'd be better for me, because I could kind of slide ahead. I could pass them on that turn, and I could, I could be ahead of them that way. I don't know, maybe in, in, certainly when you're in, in searching for a marriage partner, when you're looking for a spouse, a wife or a husband, there might be somebody that the two of you are both interested in and that person's heartbreak might rebound to your, your relationship getting started. But a true friend isn't going to do things like that. You ought to despise the kind of gain that will come to your life at the expense of somebody you love. You ought to say, I don't want to get ahead like that. Jonathan says, I don't want to be king if it means David has to die. Not only that, but the Lord has said that David is to be the next king, and I serve the Lord. What do you think Jonathan's reward in heaven is going to be like, friends? Because I don't need to be king. God comes first. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We all know this, that there are times where people do abandon you. when They should stand with you, and they don't. Solomon knew that. But he also knows, but there is a certain kind of friend. That'll stick closer than a brother to you. Yeah, you might have many companions. There's no guarantee that it's all going to work out, but you ought to find those friends that are going to stick closer than a brother. And I'll say more than that, you need to be that kind of friend to somebody else. If you have companions by your side, you can do just about anything, can't you? If you've got to do it by yourself, that's hard. you got friends with you, all right, we can do this. You've got an impossible task. You've got a, a, a terrible job you've got to do in the yard. Maybe a tree fell over or something like that. And, you know, you've got to chop it all up and get rid of it. If you've got some buddies out there with you and you're kind of sharing the misery, hey, it's all right. We're all, we all got this. It's like when you're in school. If you got detention, miserable. Detention with a friend, best time of your life. <laughs> kind of weird how it works out like that, isn't it? You might even have days where you will be nostalgic for the hard times of life because you remember the depth of friendship that you developed during that time. Isn't that interesting? So be that for one another. Don't just pine for that. Don't just hope for that. I hope you find it. But be that for somebody else. Be that for somebody else. Verse 35. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David and with him a little boy, his, his page, you might say. And he said to his boy, run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the boy, Hurry, be quick, do not stay. Kind of giving coded messages to David, right? Do not stay, get out of here. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master, but the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, Go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. So the plan was, David would wait by the stone heap, and Jonathan will fake target practice to either signal to him, hey, it's safe to come home, 
or you better get out of here, David. But it is interesting to me, and I remember even as a kid reading this and not quite understanding it. Like, okay, if they had, why the, why the mysterious signal if they were just going to talk face to face anyway? I think the best answer to that question is when David had this confirmation from Jonathan, it so broke his heart, and it so broke Jonathan's heart. It's like, we need to see each other. I, we can't just leave it like this. Because I think Jonathan set up the plan with the, the thought that David's being a little paranoid, it's all going to work out just fine. He didn't realize that, no, dad's after you, and he's kind of after me too. They had to see each other again. And you see David bowing before Jonathan. This is so important. David is not a usurper of the throne. David is not trying to take this. He says, I'm acknowledging that you are the son of the king, the son of the Lord's anointed. And they wept loudly together. And it says they kissed one another. This should be obvious, but this is, this is cultural, not sexual. You even see folks from certain parts of the world, they see each other, the Middle East or Eastern Europe even, and they'll see each other and there's the kiss on the cheek or sometimes even a kiss on the lips. It's not, I, I don't want to get back into that again, but this is not evidence of some, some sin in the two of their lives. Even Peter would tell us, greet one another with a holy kiss. We shake hands these days, right? But that doesn't mean that that's, it, they were the same way in this time. This is not the last time the two of them shall meet. There will be one more case but their relationship is never going to be the same again. And I mentioned before, our culture values friendship, and it, and it does. And there's even another lesson to be taught sometimes, I think, that we can value friendship to the detriment of family. <laughs> People talk about, my family is so toxic, and they're so awful, I don't want anything to do with them. I need my friends. And meanwhile, their friends are just as awful and toxic, but they say, yeah, but we stick together. Like, well, that's admirable, but you should do that for your, your family too, Right? Yeah, that this, this loyalty and, and grace and forgiveness you have for your friends, show that to your, your parents as well. But I don't want to dive into that. I do want to talk, though, that we are living in an age of detachment, aren't we? Where we're just, we feel a little detached from life. And it almost gets tired to say this. You know, I mean, I'm a millennial. Like, I've been hearing this my whole life, and I get sick of hearing it. You know, you kids are on the, on the screens too much, and you're on TV too much. And community, well, you bought it for me, and you gave it to me. So what am I, you know, it's, you invented these things. What do you want me to do? But, but all joking aside, we know how it feels to just feel detached. You feel like everybody else is having a great time. Everybody else has these amazing friendships and these amazing marriages, and they go on these outstanding vacations, and their houses are all perfect, and I'm out here missing out on all this. You're spending time online, it almost seems like everybody's dating a supermodel but me. This is a very male thing that guys deal with, and you have to sometimes tell them, hey man, it's not real life. But what it leads to is us becoming so focused on our own time and on ourselves that village life, so to speak, is, is kind of dying out. You know, you watch those old movies where it's a small town and everybody knew each other and, you know, or the old west where everybody didn't even like each other very much, but hey, we're neighbors, so we might as well get along as best we can, right? Well, now you live in a day and age where you don't need to see anybody if you don't want to. You know, if you just want to work from home and stay on the computer and, and put your AirPods in, you don't have to talk to anybody. And I don't think any of us really like that, but we all do that to one degree or another. And what this leads to is shallow friendships, shallow friendships. And we ought to be working over time in this era to make sure that we have deep relationships with one another, intimate relationships with one another. What do we know today? What do you know of the hurt of separation, of how it feels to be separated from somebody and know you might never see them again and just feel your heart ripped out? What do we know today of a fierce loyalty that we can say with a straight face is more important to me than my romantic relationship? brotherhood. You know, we, we try to manufacture these things. They're like, well, we all vote the same way, or we all look the same way, or we all live in the same place. But th those are just labels. What, what kind of real intimacy do you have with somebody else? This kind of friendship that we see here with Jonathan and David, all I'm really trying to make the point today, a pretty simple message really, is this is the ideal to strive for, which is exactly what Christ showed us. Jesus showed his disciples what friendship looked like. He loved them for three years. And that's why he said, I don't even call you servants anymore. I know I'm your teacher. I know I'm your master. But really, we're friends. He says, and the greatest love that a man can demonstrate is to lay down his life for his friend. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And that's why the New Testament is replete with instructions for Christians to love one another. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10, Paul said, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, 
For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And that's kind of my, my lesson today. I'm not coming here saying that you people aren't loving each other right. Do it better. It's, yeah, you know, you're doing this. But more and more. More and more. If you're new here and you feel like you, you haven't quite connected with anybody, I, I encourage you to take the time to get to know people. That time before service when we say, hey, greet those that are around you, that's just not, not just time for me to get my act together and get my notes and get the team off the stage. That's to initiate conversations that can then continue when the service is over. To get each other's name, to make sure everybody feels welcome, because you are welcome in this place. I encourage you to participate in the different events and the different studies we have. Ladies, you've got your Bible study tonight. If you feel like, I just don't have good female friends, you need to come out to that. Now, we can do this weird thing like, yeah, but they might be all young ladies, and I, I want people that are my age. I want people that are into the things I'm into. It's, look, we have Jesus in common, and that's enough. And then as life goes on, your best friends are usually not the people you thought were going to end up being your best friends. Right? Gentlemen, we had the men's breakfast yesterday. Both these things have been very well attended, but the reason we have events like yesterday, where we didn't crack open the Bible, we didn't have a study, we didn't have prayer, what do we do? We were just hanging out. Being friends with one another. Getting a little closer with each other. And then, of course, most of our fellowship is going to be around the gospel or evangelism or, or Bible study. But we've got to work hard to develop these friendships. Because you see that the Lord was between Jonathan and David. And that was the foundation of the relationship. I tell my children all the time, and it applies here. That, you know, when they're real little, I say, I love you. I say, Do you love me the most? And, no, I love Jesus the most. And then I love you. And at first, they kind of don't like that. But you explain to them, no, no, no. Loving Jesus first makes me love you better. If I put Jesus first, my capacity for love will grow. And even though you won't rank first, you will receive more love than you would otherwise. Because God's love never runs out and never fails and always calls us higher and always calls us to be better. And it's the same thing with our friendships. If Jesus is at the center then it's going to be better. That's why you can go on a missions trip to Uganda or Nepal or Peru or wherever, and you meet believers there, and in two minutes, you're buddies. Because you got Jesus in common. Hey, we, we both know the same Lord. We read the same Bible. Sometimes we even sing some of the same old songs, and we might be very different otherwise. When I go to Russia, and I have some dear Christian brothers in Russia, we got some very different political opinions, as you can imagine. I remember being in Red Square. I don't know why I'm telling this story, but I was trying to close. But I was in Red Square, which is, that's where uh, Basil's Cathedral is. That's where the Kremlin is. They've got uh, Lenin's tomb is there. They've got his big bust of Stalin, his head staring at you right out there. And I remember talking to some of these guys, and Sasha was one of the guys. They're all named Sasha. All the boys are named Sasha. And um, we're talking, and I was like, yeah, man, Lenin. I mean, kind of, you're kind of feeling it out. Like, how exactly do we feel about Lenin now? And, and he's like, oh, well, no, yeah, he was a, a very bad man. But you know what? He, he was what we needed for that time. And so I, I still think of him as a hero, even though obviously it was, and I'm saying that he killed an awful lot of people, man, you know. And, but that's a, that's a pretty strong difference. I'm as red-blooded an American as anybody here, you know. And we were actually were in Russia on that trip during the 4th of July, and we were all wearing American flags on our shirts. And uh, it was like we're spending, we're spending the 4th of July across enemy lines, but it's, it's all a joke. They... <laughs> It was, we had a lot of fun just teasing each other about that and just, and we actually got more people passing us on the streets and asking us questions about our shirts and, oh, from America. And they'd say, well, what are you doing here? And I'd say, well, let me tell you why I'm here. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And off we'd go. All I'm trying to say with that is when we have Jesus in common, some of these other differences just kind of fall by the wayside because that's more important. People today... All of us are so desperate for real connection to God and man. And we know how to do that because God has shown us, hasn't he? So let's go out and let's show the world how to be friends.